Let me invite you to open your Bibles this morning to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, in just a few moments, we'll get to uh, verses 11 through 17, and we'll unpack it together. But I want to welcome you to Gospel City Church today. It's known as Vision Sunday, and uh, what that means is we're just talking about uh, what is true and dear to our hearts as a church, and, and Scripture says without vision, uh, the people have no direction, and so we want some vision directed by the Word of God to lead us forward as a church. And so today is a a momentous day. It's a celebratory day. We run a new fiscal year that starts in September every year, and so this is kind of a reset moment uh, to get our eyes on what Christ has called us to and where we're going in the future. But in 2023, Uh, We changed our mission statement to be love God, love people, and make disciples of all nations. And so we are a people on a journey uh, to to, uh, have full engagement, whole person engagement caught up in the adoration of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who was slain. And we're focusing on our discipleship, which helps us become the people who will love the world like Jesus loves the world. Let me just clarify on that mission statement. I realize that that is the journey that every single believer should be on. I realize that every person in this room is at different stages in their walk with Jesus. I also realize that the mission statement is not all that creative. Uh, It's not um, uh, that spectacular. It's merely the words that Jesus said, and that's the point. Uh, I want us to be a church who knows exactly what our Savior has called us to, and we're living in it. We're acting it out. We're, we're believing it and being formed by it daily. But I'm preaching congregationally this morning. I know that we're at all different parts of the journey, but we are stronger together than we are apart. And the gathered body who is unified in purpose and aim will have a more profound impact when they're scattered in the world. So it was at the vision gathering last year in August. I believe we had like an afternoon where some members came back and joined us for some worship and just some teaching and some time looking forward. I said that we are aiming to be four kinds of things, a worshiping church, a family church, an equipping church, and a missional church. So a worshiping church, we're committed to the bold adoration of Jesus Christ, vertical, fervent worship, loving him with our whole being. And then since 2020, we've been talking about what it means to be a family church, really trying to get this body life thing right. Uh, God is, is uh, glorified when he saves an individual, but he is doing something so beyond you and me. He's, he's building up a body that will become his holy temple in eternity, and Jesus Christ is the head. And so he's joined us together. We're many different parts, many different gifts, and yet there should be unity among us. And then we said we want to be an equipping church. We talk about disciples of Jesus at our church glorify God and they gather together and they grow in Christ and in maturity so that they could go. And then we also said we have work to do in becoming a missional church. Since 2021, we've really been focusing on what it means to be an equipping church, equipping the saints. Said differently, uh, we've been working on our proactive discipleship opportunities within our body. So you've seen over the last several years some different classes pop up, core scripture, core doctrine. We we added a layer two last year called Academy that's just taking believers into a deeper relationship and understanding with Jesus Christ. Those are to help form our beliefs in the Lord's studies help us understand how to study the Bible. And so every Wednesday, whenever we gather uh, at this church throughout the fall and the spring, uh, the men gather in the morning, the women gather throughout the day, our students gather at night, and they're opening their Bibles. We have small group components to everything that we do, and there are small groups meeting all around the city because we believe that believers are stronger together. Uh, you need to be in intentionally vulnerable situ- or, uh, re- small group situations where you can open up and where you can t- say the things that you're struggling with and so that you can know that you're not alone in following Jesus. Our kids are studying the same passages that we study in here on Sundays. Our students and young adults are being challenged in God's word. They're discussing God's word and they're growing in community with one another. So I hope that you're taking part in some aspect of the body life that's geared toward helping you be equipped as a disciple. I hope that you're growing in Christ here at this church. Everything 
I just mentioned is a foundation that's been built for equipping believers. We're going upwards for more mature believers, and I'm excited about some things that we're working on that will go downwards to get really practical and applicational for the saints in this church who are struggling maybe in different areas or just walking through different seasons of growth. That's everything that we're doing on the regular in this building. And I'm excited about being an equipping church, but if we stop there, we are in great danger of missing the point to which Christ has called us. See, Christ hasn't called us to merely be smarter people or or more knowledgeable people or safer people or more comfortable people or more entertained people. He certainly hasn't called Christians to be like an island cut off from the rest of the world. And, And as our church gets bigger... It could be really easy, right, to just find all of your community here and and be safe within these doors and be here every single day and every single night and you're like, I'm good. I don't need what's going on out there. But we could say that when uh, when the people of God cease to live on mission outside of its own walls, the church can become institutionalized and it can even slowly decay and eventually die. If you look at the landscape of churches in America, what some would call the megachurch movements, you could see that eventually the vision runs dry if you're only focused on yourself. Eventually, there's, there's not a lot of work to do inside the building if you're only focused on butts in the seats. And that's not the kind of church that I want Gospel City to be, that our elders want Gospel City to be, that our pastors pray that we would be. More programs, more events, more attendance, even more Bible knowledge is never the end goal, but it's obedience to what Christ has called us to. We want to be doers of the word of God. But here, understand how this goes together, why we've been focusing on being an equipping church. The church that is properly equipped will be a missional church. So that's why this year, as we step into 2024, 2025, The theme, if you will, for the year is going to be always on mission, always on mission. Maybe you saw it out in the lobby on the big missions center wall that we kind of are working on and creating, and I have it on my shirt here today. You can get a shirt out there if you want, but always on mission is not just some pithy statement, okay, that that I, I will make us feel better as a church. And uh, always on mission, I hope, is not just a theme for our church that dies after one year. I'm praying that always on mission becomes a centerpiece of visibility for what God is accomplishing through us in the world. I pray that it would be a centerpiece of visibility for more opportunities to love our city and our world as the people of God. And for more stories to come out of people who are being sent to the nations from this body. I want you to get a vision with me of what if God wanted to call you to the mission field? What if God wanted to use you in a way beyond what you ever thought he could do? What if there was an avenue to point you in the direction so that you could go into all the world and make disciples of all nations? Always on mission is something I'm praying will continue to form us as the priesthood of believers who gather at Gospel City. We talk about disciples who go and who live sent, but always on mission is an attempt to close the gap between the minister and and the regular congregants who are coming in the seat. Uh, You know, I want to live my life on mission, and I've been convicted even getting to this place today that there are different places in my life that I need to open my hands and say, here I am, Lord, send me. There are different things that the Lord wants to do with me in the position he's put me in so that I could live my life on mission and not just grow stagnant, not just grow into the mundane, not just grow standing still and, and, and waiting around in my faith. But the Lord wants to do that in your life. The Lord can use you. The same spirit that's in me, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives inside of you. So I want you to just come with me on a, on a journey for a moment. Just think about your lot in life right now. Think about where you are. Think about what questions you wrestle with, deep questions of life. Think about the job the Lord has put you in. Think about the family the Lord has put you in. Think about the community the Lord has put you in. As I read over us, the great commission given by Jesus. Just think about those. Matthew 28, Jesus said this. Now the 11 disciples 
went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now what's been burning on my heart as we approached this Sunday is that when it comes to the Great Commission, there is no wiggle room for believers. You're either saved to make other disciples or you're not living out the mission that Christ has called you to. And you may be stagnant in your faith. And that's why we're so glad that you're here. That's why we're so glad that you come and and that's why we would aim to equip disciples at this church. That's why we provide classes and studies throughout the week so that disciples would be equipped to go. And and we're glad that you're here if you're wrestling and if you're stagnant in your faith, but eventually we want you to catch the vision that you have all that you need to make disciples in the world. You may be ill-equipped, which is why we would push you toward one of those things. You may be stagnant, like I said, which is why we maybe would push you to a small group, or you may be spiritually dead. You're coming to church, you're checking things out, you're wondering what this is all about, you, you like the music, you like the talks every week, and that's why we'll always preach the gospel boldly and simply and clearly every single week because we believe that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, but eventually you got to make a decision as to whether or not you're going to follow Jesus and get on mission on the mission that he's called you to. He has called you to something so much higher a purpose so much greater than anything you could find in this life. Charles Spurgeon, he was a a pastor that many Christians love. Listen to this quote. He says, if Jesus is precious to you, you will not be able to keep your good news to yourself. You will be whispering it into your child's ear. You will be telling it to your husband. You will be earnestly imparting it to your friend. Without the charms of eloquence, you will be more than eloquent. Your heart will speak and your eyes will flash as you talk of the sweet love of Jesus. Every Christian here is either a missionary or an imposter. Recollect that. You either try to spread abroad the kingdom of Christ or else you do not love him at all. It cannot be that there is a high appreciation of Jesus and a totally silent tongue about him. That's convicting. That's something to think about. That's something to recollect all week long. What made Charles Spurgeon uh, such a, a wonderful pastor, the lasting effects of Charles Spurgeon, was that he called the everyday people of his church to action. He spurred his people toward evangelism and bold living for Christ in whatever context that God had placed them. He was after his people being always on mission to their family, Always on mission to their friends. Always on mission to their workplace. Always on mission to their country. Always on mission to their places of leisure and places of fun. Now, you open to Romans chapter 10. Let me try to show you quickly this morning the beauty of your involvement in the Great Commission and the necessary and logical progression that every believer must think through. All right, let's read Romans chapter 10. I'll start in verse 11 and go to 17. Hear the word of the Lord. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing the riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Verse 14, how then will they call on him whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. 
Now, I just want to work through this text with you a little bit this morning as you catch a glimpse of God's divine involvement of human beings in the Great Commission, okay? Point number one that I'll give to you is this. Every human has a response necessary for salvation. Every human has a response necessary for salvation. Look back at verse 11 in your Bible. It says, for the Scripture says, and we care about what the Scripture says as believers because we believe it's the God-breathed words that he breathed out. The breathed out words of God. It's profitable for teaching and reproof and correction and training in righteousness. God wrote a book. And we believe it's been preserved for our good. So scripture says everyone who believes in him, Jesus, will not be put to shame. So first thing, if we take the inverse of that, everyone who does not believe in Jesus will be put to shame. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, 13, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction and those who enter by it are many. So the reality of the majority of mankind is that they are heading towards shame and destruction. Just get a picture of the world with me. There are 8.2 billion people on planet earth. According to the Joshua Project, there are 17,446 unique people groups in the world. 7,391 of them are considered unreached with the gospel. That means they don't have a Bible in their language. They don't have someone speaking the precious gospel of Jesus Christ to them like I'm doing to you today. They may have never even heard of the person Jesus 3.4 billion people live in unreached people groups with little or no access to the gospel of Jesus Christ. 3.4 billion out of 8.2 billion. And then let's just take the rest of the population, the rest of the reached people, the majority of people have not surrendered their lives to the lordship of Jesus Christ. So Pew Research says that in America, we're rapidly declining with those who claim to be Christian And we're rapidly increasing with those who claim to be religiously unaffiliated. It's kind of good news for the believer because as some people deny the faith, we will see those who have actually counted the cost to follow Jesus Christ. But really a sobering statistic. Not only that, but those who claim to be Christian, the number gets smaller and smaller when it pertains to what we would call first tier doctrinal issues. So you start throwing out doctrinal issues like, is Jesus the only way to eternal life with God? We would say yes. Many would say no. And so we start drawing the line on who's actually a believer, who actually believes what Christ has said in his word according to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The majority of the world does not believe in Christ, therefore is heading toward being put to shame. Now the second thing I'll draw out of verse 12 is God is a missional God who sent his son on a mission to save all types of people. Look at verse 12. There is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. So there's one Lord over all of the nations of the world. Out of 17,446 unique people groups, there is one Lord. Just let that blow your mind once again. He is sovereign, he is in control, he created all people, and he is over all. There's one way to salvation, one way to eternal life, and one true God who loves all of the world. Now the third observation comes from verse 13. It says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. There is a necessary response when it comes to receiving the gospel of Jesus Christ. No one is born a Christian. Yeah, you were born into America. Yeah, you may have been born into a Christian family, but no one is born a Christian. You are born dead in your trespasses and sins at enmity with God. Nothing you could do could save you except for the the grace of God. God that came through the person of Jesus Christ who died on a cross in your place as a substitute for your sin. And when the Holy Spirit hits your heart because of the message that's coming out of my mouth right now or the message that's been written down in your language by the grace of God, the Spirit opens your heart 
and you got one opportunity. You have, you have one response necessary. You either reject the gospel or you receive Christ as Lord and you call upon him and your life can be changed forever. No one's born a Christian. No one's born on the path to eternal life. Proximity to Christianity does not make you a Christian. Just like proximity to Jesus in the New Testament didn't make everyone who was around him a Christian. And salvation requires a response. Paul tells us what that response should look like in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 10. I'll put it on the screen for you, but Paul says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That means you say with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is King. I'm no longer ruling my life. I'm no longer trying to be the God of this world. I want to make Jesus the King of my life. And then your heart needs to back up what your mouth says. And so you believe in your heart that all of this is true. You put your trust and faith in Jesus who rose again from the dead that he might be your King. Now, I know it's Vision Sunday, and I know I'm talking to the, the greater body of Christ, but it's, it's so important that we press through the gospel, always. Not just the message that we believed in our past, but it's a message we re-preach to ourselves every single day, and it should continue to stoke our worship. It should continue to draw us into relationship with Christ. But have you responded the way Romans 10 asks you to respond? Have you believed that you are saved because of your birth, because of your family, because of going to church, because of singing the songs, because of being a good person. The Bible would tell us there is no such thing. Only those who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And so scripture beckons us this morning to cry out to God the way that Paul reminds us we should cry out. But secondly, if you are truly saved, how often do you let the reality of six billion plus people on their way to hell fuel your missional urgency as a believer? How often? The second point that I'll give to you from the text is this. Every hearer needs a preacher. Every hearer of the gospel of Jesus Christ needs a preacher. Look at verse 14. How then will they, the ones who are heading toward eternal shame, how will they call on him whom they have not believed, and how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard, and how are they to hear without someone preaching? I want you to allow Paul's missional urgency, uh, his logic to fuel your missional urgency with me. Paul tells us, all must call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. Then he takes us through this progression that shows the grace of God to include us in the mission of seeing believers made around the world. Those who are on their way to destruction, they can't call on Jesus if they haven't believed in Jesus. They can't believe in Jesus if they haven't heard about Jesus. And they can't hear about Jesus if no one preaches to them about Jesus. Pretty simple, Paul's making it. Every hearer needs a preacher. Behind every true believer is someone who opened their mouth to present the message of hope and reconciliation to God with them. You might say, well... What about people who read the Bible and got saved? Yeah, but God used people to get that word in their language and get that Bible into their hands so that they could read the breathed out words of God. It takes people to move this thing forward because of the grace of God. The faith to grasp the offer of God is in the preached word of God. So there's an instance in, there's not an instance in the book of Acts, was reflecting on this and marveling at this, This week, not an instance in the book of Acts where the gospel is preached by anyone other than a human instrument. So as you go through the book of Acts and and the church was spreading and believers were being made and no one had ever heard the true gospel because the apostles were the first ones to take it to the street. But in Acts chapter 2, we see Peter preaching at Pentecost. Yeah, the Holy Spirit showed up. Yeah, everyone was proclaiming the powerful deeds of Christ. But then Peter went to preaching and he started sharing the whole Truth, the whole counsel of God, the whole gospel of Jesus Christ. And 3,000 souls were saved that day. In Acts chapter 8, the Spirit sends Philip to the Ethiopian eunuch. man already had questions. The man was already contemplating Isaiah 53. But the Spirit sends Philip to go and speak to the man. In Acts chapter 10, we see Cornelius. 
He's a man who seemed upright. He was God-fearing. He was of the Italian cohort. He was generous. He was already giving to the God of the Jews and praying regularly to the God of the Jews. But an angel comes and appears to Cornelius. Don't you think it would be just smart on God's part to have angels save humans? But he doesn't do that. An angel shows up to Cornelius and an angel says, go and find a guy named Peter. He's got a message that he wants to deliver to you, that he needs to deliver to you. And at the same time, Peter's like having a wild man's dream about food and hunting and all this stuff. And, and, and the spirit says to him, you need to go a day's journey to a Gentile man named Cornelius. And so Peter goes to Cornelius' house and he crosses over the doorstep of a Gentile and Peter preaches the whole gospel to Cornelius. This man seems as if he's following God, but Peter doesn't treat him that way. Peter doesn't come in and say, all the things you've been doing are right things. We are brothers in Christ. No, he goes and treats him as an unbeliever and he speaks the whole gospel He says that you crucified Jesus on a cross, that Jesus died in our place for our sins, and Jesus rose again from the dead so that you could be saved. And Cornelius and his whole household were saved that day. God's powerful enough to do it on his own. God's certainly powerful enough to do it through angels, but God in his grace has decided to include you in his plan for salvation all around the world. One missionary has said, the gospel means good news, but technically it can only be good news if it gets to someone in time. So how does the gospel get to somebody in time? Through the faithful saints who live always on mission until Christ comes again. And what I want you to hear in that passage, that verse, how will they hear without someone preaching? The word preaching in Romans chapter 10 It doesn't mean a professional behind a pulpit, and it doesn't mean someone who's got their seminary degree or their master's of divinity. It doesn't mean an eloquent speaker or presenter. We know from Ephesians chapter 4 that Christ has given the church pastors and elders and shepherds and teachers and evangelists, and there's a place for that to shepherd the body of Christ, and we thank God for our leaders in our church But in this instance, the word preach can be traced to one who proclaims the gospel. If you look at verse 15, where Paul quotes from Isaiah, he says, How beautiful are the feet of those who preach, there's the word, the good news. The the Greek word is ewangelizo, and it means tell of the good news, speak of the good news. That word can even be translated to gossip the good news. I love that. I thought about that this week. Some of y'all could like... Maybe you would raise your hand and be like, I'm good at gossiping. <laughs> Gossiping's not a great thing. It's actually a pretty destructive thing in the body of Christ. But what would it look like for you to gossip the gospel everywhere you go? Like what would it look like for you to be going around every corner at work so you can whisper the powerful deeds of Christ to your coworkers? What would it look like for you to, to be in the grocery store and as you're checking out, you just, have to, you just have this burning sensation on your lips to speak the truth of Jesus Christ, to gossip the good news. Every here needs someone to gossip the good news to Jesus to them. That's a great thing that we could take with us. Every here needs a preacher. And then number three, every preacher needs a sender. Every preacher needs a sender. Look at verse 15. How are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. So hearers can't hear without a preacher. Preachers cannot preach without a sender. And this is something I pray, will continue to define us as a body here at Gospel City Church. I'm grateful for the bold preaching of God's word. I'm grateful for believing in the firmly, firmly in the power of prayer and for the, the, the bold and whole person engagement in worship. I don't see any of that changing. But what goes up must always go out. I want to be a strong worshiping church whose eyes are set on Jesus Christ as our king. But what goes up has to go out. The the love that we say we have for God will be seen in the way that we love people and go to the nations, go to our city, go to our community, go to our world. 
And as we continue to look to Christ and worship Christ and become like Christ, it must send us into the world to make disciples. I'm praying that some of you would be sent to the nations and we want to be your sending church. I'm praying that we would grow as a sending church. We have partnerships that we're growing and working on so that we could become and be a sending church, so that we could get people onto the mission field, so that we could plant more churches, so that we could see young adults rise up and get a burning for the nations, get a burning for the other places in the world that haven't heard the gospel. I love that you're here. I love that you come here. I love that you love to be here. But man, I would love to kick you out of here and get you out on the streets proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, as Paul's writing this in verse 15, he's speaking of himself as the preacher and Christ as the sender. Okay? And, and the same would be true about the apostles in the Great Commission. They were uh, unique characters, guys, that Jesus called. They saw Jesus specifically, and Jesus sent them out on mission. And so they were empowered by Christ, and they were sent by Christ. No more apostles today, but we are followers of Jesus. And today, we are included in the Great Commission. Okay, don't, don't lose that. You are commissioned by Christ through the living and active word of God. We must be actively imitating Christ by sending others to see the gospel advance all around the world. So there's two aspects. You're sent, and you need to be a sender. Uh, we're all sent as a church, and yet our church needs to be a sending church. So there's two aspects to this. Let's apply it to our lives. Every believer is already sent by Christ. Therefore, you need to live sent wherever God has you. You hear us talk about living sent but like I said, I'm trying to close the gap on the wiggle room. I think sometimes we could come to church and we could say, boy, I love, I, yeah, I'm a, I'm a living sent Christian because you have proximity to somebody in this church who is really good at that. And I want you to see that the Spirit of God wants to make you effective for the Great Commission. In fact, if you truly love Jesus with your heart, soul, mind, and strength, then your equipping should lead to your going. And I, I do want to encourage us as a church. I see some of you doing this in beautiful and bold ways. I really do. Our, church, our, our staff marvels at it. We don't marvel at it enough. We need to celebrate some of the ways that the body is, is living this out in our community. I see some of you using your realtor positions for the glory of God and for the good of others. And I love it. The stories are awesome. I, I hear about some of you meeting with people because of your job but then you turn those conversations into gospel moments and gospel conversations all the time. And it kind of blows my mind. I see moms sharing Jesus consistently and patiently in their homes. And I want to commend you if you're a mom doing that. Because it kind of can be a thankless job. And not a lot of people see what you're doing on the regular. And yet this is you caring for your Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. We have a job to do. You don't just leave this place and depend on the church to raise your children. You do the hard work every single day of living on mission, being always on mission in your home. Great job, moms. I hear of businesses aiming to impact people and the city for Christ, even in the midst of building a product or getting a job done. There are teachers, there are financial advisors, there are parachurch workers and normal everyday people sharing Jesus with waitresses at grocery stores and with their neighbors. And I love every story and I commend you for your boldness and I want to encourage all of us to get on board and live sent because we are sent by Christ himself. Don't think God can't use you in the job that he has you in. Don't think God can't use you because of your youthfulness. Don't think God can't use you because you're not an eloquent speaker or because you don't know everything there is to know. Go and speak the good news of Jesus. Go and gossip the gospel as somebody has done to you in your life. But the second aspect that I want to always be thinking about, I'm thinking about it for my own life, is an aspect of radical surrender. There needs to be a radical surrender piece for all of us when it comes to the Great Commission. What would it look like for you to really pray, here I am, Lord, send me? That's what Isaiah prayed. He, he went to the throne room and he stood before the angels and he saw 
the Lord high and lifted up and the train of his robe filled the temple. You know what? If I got zapped up to the throne room right now, there is no way I want to come back here. No way. I'm staying there, man. But Isaiah, what goes up goes out. And until you're done breathing, God's not done using you. And so Isaiah says, here I am, Lord, send me. And the Lord sends him to a really hard thing, a really hard place. Not a lot of people were going to obey him. But he goes and he speaks the gospel. What might God want to do with you beyond the here and now for the sake of the gospel somewhere where it's never been preached? What might God use you for in this community if you were to surrender to that opportunity that's been knocking at your door? (laughs) You maybe have some opportunities where you're like, I should get involved there. I should go and serve there. I should go and love those people, but it's going to take less sleep. It's going to take more time. It's going to take more energy, and I just don't know if I can give that up. I got some of those opportunities on my plate right now that I am seeking the Lord on. Lord, where do you want me to radically surrender? Lord, what needs to die in my life so that I can live more on mission for Jesus Christ? Every person in this room can be asking and praying those things. What might God ask of you if you were to give him access into your bank account and ask him to help you use your finances to send others around the world for the cause of Christ. I want more opportunities for that to come. Our church is doing some exciting things. We'll tell you about it in a member meeting in September concerning the money that we do have and and convictions for 15% of our money to always be going outside of our walls to the Great Commission for church planning, for international, for domestic in our city, and for short-term missions trips. We want to be a giving, generous, sending church. But there is so much more we can do, I believe, if we would catch this vision. The fourth point that I'll give to you as we close is this. Every believer has all they need to be always on mission. Every believer has all that they need to be always on mission. Look at verse 16 in your Bible. But they have not all obeyed the gospel, Paul says. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? And understand this this morning. It is not our job to save anyone. But it is our job to go. Isaiah said, here am I, send me to the Lord. And the Lord sent him to a place where most people would reject his message. And yet Isaiah's faithfulness is seen in his obedience to live sent, not in his track record to produce converts. I want that to be the testimony of this church. I don't care how many butts are in the seats. I want our faithfulness and our track record to be measured by a faithful God in the end that the people of Gospel City Church, they weren't there to be entertained. They weren't there for good messages. They weren't there just to get filled up and then go and do whatever they wanted to do. They came and they left declaring the good news of Jesus Christ, the gospel. So lest you think I'm not good enough to make an impact, the Lord is in charge of the harvest and he just needs willing laborers and it's our job to go. Look at verse 17. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. There's no believing without hearing. There's no hearing without preaching. There's no preaching without sending. And the word of Christ is the tool that we've all been given so that we can make much of Jesus And so that we can transform, be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And so that we can speak Christ without fear in the world. As we step into the new year, I want to give you four things to contemplate. Four things to pray through. We're going to have lots of more, lots more opportunities through Always on Mission. We're creating some Always on Mission Sundays where we'll just talk about what God's doing through this church and and in the nations and how you can get involved. So look out for all of those opportunities. Here's four things to leave with today and to contemplate today even as you're out on that field. Number one, gossip the gospel. Who's the one person you need to go and gossip the gospel to? Maybe this week, maybe this year. Begin to pray for them. Begin to pray for boldness. Begin to pray for God to help you get over your fear of the awkward conversation or not knowing what to say. Number two, get equipped. It's what I said, what goes up goes out. And so if you're not going out, then you probably need to go up a little more. You probably need to get equipped, get in a class, get in a study, get around some other men or some other women that can spur you on to good works in Jesus Christ. Number three, have missional eyes. (laughs) My wife listens to a song every week when she comes to Gospel City Church because 
in this season of our life, this is where God has sent us. And the song says something like, help me to love with open arms like you do, a love that erases all the lines and sees the truth, so that when they look in my eyes, they would see you, even in just a smile, would they see the Father's heart. Would you ask the Lord to give you missional eyes, that everywhere you go, people would see something different about you and that they would just lean in and, and, and that it would help you to live sin. And then finally pray, here I am, Lord, send me. Pray it for the everyday and the mundane, but also pray that the Lord would lead you into a, a deeper level of radical surrender to the great commission of Jesus Christ.